and welcome to Food for Faith. We're glad that you're able to tune in and join us this evening as we continue our study in John's letter of Revelation at the end of the Bible. Before we turn to God's Word this evening, let's just commit ourselves to God in prayer. Let's unite our hearts before the throne. Our Lord and God, we give thanks that you are God and that you are good. We give thanks that you are the one who inhabits the throne room of heaven, the one who resides upon the throne, that you are a sovereign God over and above all things, that all things come to pass at your discretion. We thank you, Lord God, that you are the one whose name is holy, who is high and lifted up, King of kings and Lord of lords, that you are the unchanging God, the God of uh, creation, the one who has brought into being all that we see and we know, and therefore the one who is worthy of our praise, worthy of our worship. Lord, we pray that we would be a people who hallow your name, that we would be delighted to exalt and worship you as the one who is worthy. Lord, we pray that we would be those who follow the command of Jesus to pray, that we would be those who would follow his framework in how to pray, in seeking to exalt your name, and longing for your kingdom to expand upon this earth, for yearning that your will would be done. We thank you, Lord God, that you are our provider, that you are the good shepherd, the one who leads and cares for his flock, the one who brings us by still waters and into green pastures, that you are our provider and our protector. And we pray, Lord God, that you would provide all of our needs daily, that we would look to you for all that we require. Uh, But Lord, we pray that as we do that, that we would be a people who foster a forgiving heart, who are characterized by soft and pliable hearts before you, uh, that we would dispense with all bitterness and hatreds, that we would put uh, to bed all grudges that may be held, 
and that we would forgive just uh, as you have forgiven us, though we are unworthy of it. So Lord, we pray this evening that as we open your word, a word which is unchanging, a word which stands through the tests of time, we pray that you would illuminate our hearts and minds as we uh, consider it. We pray for uh, those who are unwell at this time. We remember those who are weak in body, those fragile in mind. We think particularly of those affected and afflicted by uh, COVID-19 and coronavirus. Lord, we remember not just the afflicted, but those who uh, administer uh, care to them. We think of those in the uh, care industry, those who are uh, in the medicinal world, Lord, that you would give them wisdom and discernment and long-suffering and patience and stamina uh, as they work in what is a very demanding role and as they sacrifice so much of themselves for the good of others. We pray this weekend uh, as we stop and as we pause and as we reflect and as we remember the great sacrifice offered by many for the good uh, of their fellow countrymen, that we would give thanks for the brave men and women who gave their all, that we may be free. Uh, And Lord, we pray that we would do so uh, as we honour their memory and cherish the sacrifice that they have made for our liberty. But we pray that we would rejoice all the more in the one who died for all, in Jesus Christ, the one who gave his life as an atonement for many, uh, that we may be reconciled unto God and offered a place in his kingdom. So, Father, we pray that you would bless us this evening as we consider your word and as we look forward to the week ahead. Would you be with us, we ask, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, over the past number of weeks, when I've been leading on a Wednesday evening in Food for Faith, we've been studying Revelation. And over the past number of weeks, we've been looking at the letters to the seven churches in Asia, uh, where Jesus wrote uh, through uh, his apostle John uh, to these churches to challenge and to encourage them, uh, to challenge them in what was amiss and to encourage them in what was good. And he gave many great promises. And you may have thought that was the end of things, but we're going to continue our short study in Revelation. We're not going to be able to go through all of Revelation. And indeed, in some ways, this is a cursory glance at Revelation because there is such a wealth of information contained within the pages of this letter that it would take us, in some ways, a lifetime uh, to go through it in a really meaningful way. But if I was to delve into the detail that is contained within even these opening chapters of Revelation, we would probably still be nine or ten weeks on in chapter one. But here we are today, we're going to be looking at chapter four. But just uh, as we put it in context and as we ground ourselves in this before we read, uh, let's just remember that Revelation was written not to confuse us, not to ramp up our anxiety or our fears, but to bless us. It should be understood and it should be a means of blessing. John was writing to a people who were confused and who were uh, anxious and who were fearful, who were uh, persecuted. And this letter wasn't to amplify that in any way, but it was to remind them that things are not always as they seem. And I think we've seen that in the last number of weeks as we've looked at these different letters, that things are not always as they seem. Revelation has this element, this theme of unveiling, of bringing into view, of revealing uh, what is truly at work in our lives and what God is doing. Many of us have heard the term game changer. I'm sure you've heard that term. We use it uh, all the time when uh, perhaps something or someone changes our current situation in an incredibly significant way. So, for example, recently I was gifted a very generous gift of a mountain bike. But this wasn't just any mountain bike. It's an e-bike. It's an electric mountain bike. It is a game changer when it comes to cycling. No longer is it a chore to cycle up a hill. It's like the wind at your back, like somebody pushing yourself up that hill so that it becomes no problem 
I can go places now on a bike that perhaps previously I would never dreamed of being able to go. An e-bike for a hefty fellow like myself is a game changer. And in the same way, Revelation 4 and 5 that will we'll come to uh, in time and in, in God's providence is a game changer because uh, Jesus hands John a set of glasses, a set of specs, and these glasses, this perspective that he gives him begins to bring everything into crystal clear focus. All of us perceive our world through a set of specs, through a set of glasses. Our frame of reference, you could say, determines how and why and what we do in this world, how we live, what we do, where we go, what we think. And our perception of reality is influenced by many things, isn't it? It's influenced by perhaps our upbringing, our parents, our family, our childhood experiences, good and bad, our school experiences, our teachers, our university years, our years in the workplace. Our perception of reality for each individual is shaped by our relationships, by the books we read, by the films that we watch, by the people that we spend time with. It is shaped by our culture and through the joys and the sorrows that we experience. Well, when we perceive the world through the lens of Revelation 4 and 5, it is a game changer. So let's read from Revelation chapter 4 just now, right at the end of your Bibles in the last book and chapter 4. We read John saying, After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had heard first speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. A rainbow resembling an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were twenty-four other thrones, and seated on them were twenty-four elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. Before the throne seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also before the throne there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and behind. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. The fourth was flying like an eagle. Each of the living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under his wings. Day and night they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives for ever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives for ever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Amen. And may the Lord bless that reading of his word to us. When we look around the world and we see all that is occurring in the world, we can understand, I'm sure, to a degree, why people question the existence of God, why there is cancer in young people's lives, why there is abuse of the vulnerable and terrorist groups and terrorist acts and brokenness all around the world, man's inhumanity to man. Kevin Bridges, the Glaswegian uh, comedian who can be a, a bit raw at times, hit on that when he said, I've got PSD, PTSD just watching the news. Earthquakes, tsunamis, Donald Trump, Brexit, Kim Jong-un, Vladimir Putin, ISIS, global warming, refugee crisis, sexual harassment. I think if you believe in God, you've got to acknowledge that the guy is in over his head now. 
It's getting a bit much for God. God has lost the dressing room. It's not an isolated notion, that, though, is it? A cursory look around the world in which we live would suggest that nobody is in control, that things are going uh, wildly out of control before our very eyes, that if there is a God, then it would seem that he has just set the world up as a clock, wound it up, and let it get on with its thing. And he stands afar at a distance, not engaging, not getting involved. Is that the case? Or is it that there is a God who not only created all that we see and know, but who is also right at the control center of the world in which he created, and that everything that is coming to pass is under his sovereign control? The order of John's visions in the book of Revelation is important for us. And here we come to a significant vision for us. And I guess the question comes up, what do Christians who are facing difficulty and trial need? What is the need for those who face tribulation? Not just the tribulation of a big future event that may or may not come to pass, but in the everyday hardships of living in a world that is beset and broken by sin. Well, I think Revelation chapter 4 is a great encouragement for us, to me and to you on a Wednesday evening, uh, wherever we may be. Because John, or Jesus, invites John into the throne room of heaven, the control center, the nerve center of the world. And we get a glimpse here of what John is presented with, what he sees. Not just a throne, but a throne that is occupied. Not just a throne room, but a throne room that is uh, filled with the throng of celebration and praise and worship. What do normal everyday, ordinary, struggling, doubting, confused, anxiety-filled, fearful Christians need? What is it that we need? We need to know that somebody is in control. We need to have the, the security and the knowledge that there is perhaps a reason, even behind some of the things that we fail to comprehend and that we cannot fathom in our lives. We need to know that the throne is occupied, that it's not vacant. We need to know that the occupier of the throne is active for his creation. We need to know that God is sovereign and that he is in control and that he is involved in the life of his created world. Two brief things then this evening as we look at John's vision. And like I say, we can't possibly begin to plumb all of its depths. But firstly, we see the centrality of the throne. The dominant image in Revelation is that of the reality of a throne, a throne in heaven. Over 40 times that word is used. And even here in chapter 4, it's used 14 times. There is a throne. It is in heaven, and it is occupied. And John uses all sorts of prepositions here to paint a picture for us, a vivid picture. You have around the throne 24 elders, and from the throne come flashes of lightning and bolts of thunder, and uh, bolts of lightning and flashes of lightning, bolts of lightning as well, peals of thunder. That's what I'm looking for. Before the throne, there is a sea of glass, crystal clear. Behind the throne, there is an emerald rainbow. Around the throne, there are four living a creature, there are things before the throne, things around the throne, things coming from the throne, things behind the throne, in front of the throne. It's quite a remarkable picture, and it's a lot for us to kind of take in and to process. But what is the main point here? I guess that's what we have to ask and answer, isn't it? Well, the main point here is that the throne is occupied. The throne is occupied. Sometimes we can miss the wood for the trees. We can get lost in all of the information that's at the sides, all of the complex imagery that might be around it. We fail to, we fail to see the throne. We, we miss 
the wood for uh, the trees. The emphasis here is that John is trying to show us this evening is, is not what's around the throne or before the throne or behind the throne, but who sits on the throne. If we look unaided at this world around about us, we would say that nobody's on the throne, that it's all random, that uh, the world is chaos. But as we look at God's Word, as we are presented with Him, we see that He is on His throne, that He is sovereign, that He is God, that things are not all as they seem. And the King of Kings is seated on His throne. He's not running around the throne room in panic. He's not uh, doing that. He's sitting calmly in complete control, dictating and orchestrating all things from the power uh, of his word and will. He is in complete and utter sovereign control. He is in control of your life and mine, regardless of what we may be facing. And there's a great picture here of what God is like in a sense, because he's indescribable. He talks about uh, jasper and and carnelian, these amazing uh, colors. He's trying to convey something of what he is seeing with his eyes that God is like. He's trying to revive, in a sense, our imagination, giving a picture of this God who is uh, altogether lovely, altogether glorious, altogether radiant, altogether worthy. He is God and he is beautiful. And he is intrinsically beautiful, not by what he gives or by what he does, but because of who he is, because of who he is. Many people come to God as kind of a a donor, a dispenser of good things, that he's only worthwhile for what we can get out of him. But the Christian comes to God regardless of circumstance because they realize his beauty and his worth and his worthiness of worship. One of the ways that you know that you've encountered the God of the Bible is when you find him beautiful for who he is, when you worship him because of who he is, when you understand what he is like and what you are like by comparison. And even when he hasn't provided that job or brought you that long-awaited spouse or dealt with that illness in your life, still you worship him. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord, you say with Job, because you see what John sees, that God is beautiful and that he is worthy of your praise. So the throne is occupied, and it's occupied by the sovereign God, the one who uh, embodies beauty, the one who is majestic and full of splendor and majesty. But the throne room isn't uh, isn't a silent place. It's not a, a place where there is no activity. There is activity in the throne room. And what is that activity? It is, of course, worship. And as a result, celebration of God because of his beauty, because of his power, because of his worthiness. First, we have 24 elders. Who are they? Well, there are various schools of thought on this. Some suggest that it is the redeemed people of God. You've got the 12 tribes, the 12 disciples, 24 uh, represents the, the whole people of God. Others suggest that the 24 are like the heavenly host of elders. It's important for us not to get lost in these things and not to question so much who they are, but to recognize what they're doing. These 24 elders are lying prostrate before God, casting their crowns to him and worshiping him. Second, you've got these four living creatures, and they are unusual. They are covered with eyes everywhere. They have appearances like lions and oxes and eagles. And um, again, there are different schools of thought on this. this. But again, it's not about the DNA makeup of these creatures, but the point is that these unusual, these powerful creatures here are constantly worshipping he who occupies the throne. 
And that's what heaven is, isn't it? It is a place where God is exalted, where God is worshipped, where God is honoured, where God is rejoiced in. That is the primary focus of everyone and everything that is present in the throne room of heaven. We all worship something. We all enthrone something in our lives. I wonder what is enthroned in your life. I wonder what is worshipped in your life. What is the thing that occupies your mind? What's the thing that stirs your heart in the morning and through the day as you go about your daily business? Is it the one who is on his throne? The one who is worthy? The one who is the epitome of beauty? The one who is altogether lovely? What are all of these people saying? They're saying things like, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. You are worthy, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. There's this emphasis. Old Testament writers would uh, repeat words to emphasize them. Here we have a threefold repetition. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He is set apart. You know, in Exodus, right at the other end of the Bible, Moses in Exodus gets directions from God on how to build the tabernacle, uh, the place of worship for God's people. And what's interesting is that God says to Moses that this earthly tabernacle was to be a, a copy. It was to be designed and patterned after the real thing. We learn from the book of Hebrews that this earthly tabernacle was designed after the real heavenly temple. And in the earthly tabernacle, there was this place called the Holy of Holies. And nobody could go in there other than the high priest. And the high priest himself could only go in there once a year. And even as he only went in there once a year, he had to go in in the right way, following the right protocol. Otherwise, he would die because he was going in to where the presence of God dwelt. And here we begin to grasp what's happening with John. God is letting a sinful, mortal man like John come in to not the copy, but to the real holy of holies where God himself was seated and where John could see the unobstructed, unadulterated holiness of God. And we say, wow, how is this possible? How is John not struck dead immediately as he is faced with the glory of God? Well, remember, behind the throne, there is the rainbow that has the appearance of emerald. What is this? Why a rainbow? Well, the rainbow, if you remember in Genesis, was the sign that God gave to Noah as a promise that we still see today that he would never destroy his people as he did in the great flood. It was the sign of God's great faithfulness and mercy but in the Old Testament, the word for rainbow is actually the word that's uh, used for battle bow. And the picture that God gives to his people to display his faithfulness and mercy is a picture of a battle bow uh, cocked and aimed not at the earth, not at sinful men and women, not at wretched sinners, but aimed at himself, aimed at him pointing to the heavens. And what we see here is John being ushered in by Jesus to the throne room of heaven, seeing the unadulterated, unobscured glory of God. Why? Because on the cross, the battle bow of God was let loose, not on sinners, but on Christ that we may be invited into the throne room of heaven, that we may see God, that we may worship him, that we, with those already there, would engage in the worship of the one who is 
worthy. This is a game changer, isn't it? To know that in Christ Jesus, we have access to the throne room of heaven. Just now we have that access through prayer. And we'll be meeting at eight o'clock to pray. And I would encourage you, I would exhort you, I would urge you to come and to pray. To the God who hears and who answers. The God who is beautiful. The one who is altogether lovely. The one to whom we can come with great confidence in and through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. This evening, we rejoice in a throne that is occupied. And in a throne room where the adoration, the worship, and the exaltation of Jesus is ongoing. We thank God that in Christ Jesus, we have access to the throne room, just as John did. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its power and for its revelation. And we pray that we would be encouraged in it and that you would bless us. Go before us now and forgive us our sins, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to conclude by singing from the hymn, Before the Throne, Before the Throne of God Above. Thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, we trust that God will bless you through uh, his living word. God willing, we will be back in your screens on Sunday morning for something slightly different this week as we observe Remembrance Sunday. This year, we're not able to gather as communities physically at war memorials up and down the land uh, due to the ongoing restrictions that we have in place. But we're going to put together a remembrance service that will hopefully be meaningful and will honour those who gave off their freedom and their lives to secure our freedom and our lives. So we would encourage you to join us, encourage you to invite friends and family to come, perhaps who wouldn't usually or ordinarily tune in to online services. Do come and join us. There will be reading, there will be reflection, there will be acts of remembrance included in that service. And as usual, it will go live at 10.55 
on Sunday morning. Until then, may God bless and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.